Uh, greetings from Amersham, UK. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to our first oncology webinar today. Our speaker is uh, Professor Shima. Uh, uh, he is Professor of Radiology and Chair of Radiology for the three university hospitals in Vienna, Austria. He is also the past president of International Cancer Imaging Society, and he is well published and an eminent authority on the oncology CT imaging. Now, without any further delay, I'll pass it over to Professor Shima. So over to you, sir. Thank you, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everybody, wherever you are on this planet. Uh, welcome to our webinar on CT scanning in oncologic patients. I will uh, present our CT protocols in the patients with abnormal cancers and the challenges you may face, and I will also uh, show you some of the mistakes you would want to avoid. These are my disclosures. What are the learning objectives? Actually, four key points I would like to present. First, the importance and the risks of contrast administration in oncologic patients. And then second, the real clinical problem we face with venous access in these patients uh, uh, with cancer who had repeated injections and where we have problems with, with venous access. And then I'll present CT protocols in various oncologic entities of the abdomen, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, esophageal and gastric cancer, and also colorectal cancer. And then I'll show you some of the mistakes you would want to avoid when you deal with these patients. Well, for years and years, many studies have been published regarding the risk of iodine contrast inducing contrast induced nephropathy. And just to show you two recent large studies on this subject, uh, uh, presented by Davenport, where they looked at very large groups of patients. You see roughly 17,000 or 20,000 patients, and they found that iodine conscious material is a nephrotoxic risk factor in patients with a, a reduced GFR below 30 milliliters per minute. And they also found that there's a trend towards significance in patients with moderately impaired renal function, uh, meaning that the GFR is in the range of 30 to 44 milliliters per minute. And moreover, they found that its iodine contrast is not a risk factor in patients with a stable serum creatinine below 1.5 milligrams per deciliter. So you here this, see this graph uh, taken from this publication, the odds ratio for developing contrast-induced nephropathy in relation to pre CT creatinine, you see the higher uh, the pre-CT pre uh, uh, creatinine is, uh, the higher the odds ratio of developing uh, uh, contrast-induced nephropathy. But then, just recently, the group of McDonald presented two publications where they compared large cohorts of patients who had undergone contrast-enhanced CT and non-contrast-enhanced CT. And what they found actually was that the risk of acute kidney injury was not significantly different in these two groups. So basically patients with uh, non-contrast-enhanced CT or, or, or unenhanced CT had the same rate of acute injury of the kidney as the patient who actually got the contrast material. So their conclusion in these studies was that intravenous contrast material administration was not associated with an excess risk of acute in kidney injury, dialysis, or death. And as you can imagine, this immediately sparked a heated discussion. You see some of the answers here published, and basically this is an ongoing discussion. So what we, we know probably uh, iodine contrast has a small attributable risk in patients with multiple underlying diseases, but we still don't know how large this risk uh, is. But what we know is that patients with cancer 
uh, are slightly different because they have underlying disease. And there are some studies out in the literature which have specifically dealt with this issue of patients who have cancer and need counters enhanced CT. And here one study published in 2013 where they looked at the incidence rate of acute kidney injury in cancer patients, more than 3,000 patients who got counters enhanced CT, and they found that counters material is an independent risk factor for acute kidney injury, you see 36% versus 9%. And if you look at this, uh, this table here, you see that intravenous radio contrast, as they named it, is, has an odds ratio of 4.55. So basically, the likelihood is four times higher that the patient with cancer develop uh, acute kidney injury than the patients without cancer. This somehow confirms uh, or was confirmed by uh, the study of Hong uh, published last year where they looked again at the contrast induced nephropathy in cancer patients. Look, what are the risk factors? And they found that one risk factor, and this is something you can imagine from intuition, that serial examinations, patients undergoing repeated examinations, have a high risk factor. So you'll see the odds ratio is 4.1 in these patients. And patients who have hypotension before CT, also quite a high odds ratio of four. Then liver cirrhosis has a high odds ratio of around two. And then also, if the patients have a boom creatinine ratio larger than 20, meaning that the patient is dehydrated, this is also an independent risk factor. And these studies were some are summarized in this uh, large meta-analysis, which included 42 studies with roughly 18,000 patients, and they looked at the risk factors. Again, they said, of course, pre-existing renal insufficiency uh, is an independent risk factor that the patient will undergo then dialysis after a contrast administration. Diabetes is a risk factor, and then uh, next to diabetes, it's malignancy with an odds ratio of 1.79 being an independent risk factor, and then higher age and also some medications. So basically we know that patients with cancer are quite vulnerable to this, uh, to this problem. Second important issue in patients with cancer is that a lot of these oncology patients have not really good veins, and we have to use these very small bore IV cannulas. And with older port systems, with these implanted ports, quite often you can only give a very limited flow rate of 2 to 2.5 milliliters per second, which is a problem if you want to do a good contrast enhanced CT study. Now, for quite in, uh, a couple of years, we have new port systems. New port systems, meaning that most of them are also MR conditional, as even three Tesla, have thicker venous silicone catheters with a caliber of eight fringe, and you can inject higher uh, doses or, or higher flow rates. Here you see such an X-ray of uh, a modern power port system. It even says CT, so it's, it's absolutely able uh, to use uh, that you can uh, do a high flow injection. And then you have to put in these angled needles. And of course, if you put in uh, an angled needle with a larger caliber, so a 19 gauge needle, you can get a higher flow rate. And then you have to look at the instruction leaflet of your power port system because that will say what is the recommended maximum contrast material flow rate at 37 degrees, so at body temperature, if you put such a 19 gauge needle in there. And if you look at the, uh, at the leaflet of our, the port systems we use, it says, for example, if you use contrast material with a viscosity of 5.8, which is the viscosity of a monomeric contrast with 300 milligrams or a dimeric contrast with 270 milligrams iodine per milliliter, it would allow a flow rate of 7 milliliters per second, theoretically. 
or if you use a contrast with a viscosity of 11.4, uh, this is the roughly the viscosity of a 320 uh, uh, visipex or dimeric, or of a monomeric contrast with a viscosity with a um, uh, iodine content of 350 to 400 milligrams, so with a higher concentration, you could still use a flow rate of 6 milliliters per second. But the problem is, if you go too high during injection, then what happens is that the pressure limiter of the power injector will downregulate the flow rate or even terminate the injection. So if you look here, this is a screenshot from a power injector. You see basically here we hit the pressure limiter and then the pressure limiter downregulates the flow rate. As I'll show in a second on this video, I hope this video will load for everybody of you, uh, which shows the injection rate to see the here the pressure and immediately after start of the contrast material administration you, we hit the pressure limit and you see how it down regulates to 2.2 milliliters or or even below and then and now we are at three and it could even terminate the injection if if the resistance is too high so basically we have to know what flow rate we can give so in clinical practice with our power injector and our uh, port system, we can now use with a monomeric contrast at 300 milligrams per milliliter or a dimeric contrast at 270, a flow rate with 3.5 to 4 milliliters per second quite consistently without running into problems. Very important point is that you always use a preheated contrast material at body temperature because that lowers the viscosity and with a lower viscosity you can do a higher injection rate. But the very important message is you always have to know the port system used at your and implanted at your institution and look carefully at the instruction leaflet to see what the injection rates are possible with that system. If you do CT, what are in general using modern CT with 64, 128, or 256 uh, rows? What are in general uh, the three the important screws you can play with when you do your uh, your scanning? It's the tube current, it's the tube voltage, or it's iterative reconstruction. So with tube current modulation, with modulation of MES along the X and Y axis and along the Z axis, you get consistent image quality. And with tube voltage modification of the KV, basically by reducing the KV from 120 KV to 80 or 100 KV in small patients, you can save radiation dose. But you will increase the noise. And what can you do to reduce the noise again? you can use iterative reconstruction. This will significantly reduce the noise and those reductions of up to 50% are possible in comparison with filtered back projection. The different vendors have different iterative reconstruction algorithms, AC or VO with G, Sapphire named by Siemens or IDOS with, with Philips. And to show some examples how it, this works, with iterative reconstruction, you basically, with more iterations, you reduce the noise and you get increasing smoothing of the image. So on the left-hand uh, image, you see this is the standard filtered back projection. And with 60% iterative reconstruction, you see increasing smoothness and less noise if you look at the liver and the spleen and also on the subcutaneous fat. And if you go on to give more iterations, 100% iterative reconstruction, you see there is absolutely no no noise anymore. But you see that the image looks quite synthetic. So you have to find a good compromise between noise and image impression you would want uh, to see in your clinical practice. So by using iterative reconstruction, you can reduce the noise or if you want to have the same level of noise you can use the radiation dose in comparison to filtered back projection.
how can you tie all these things together? So if you now scan with 80 kVp instead of 120 kVp in small patients, you can reduce the radiation dose and the use of iterative reconstruction compensates for the increased noise. And the nice thing is if you scan at lower kVp, you even get more enhancement per milliliter of iodine. So for example, if you've used 0.5 grams of iodine per kilogram body weight with 120, you can go down as low as 0.03 grams of iodine per kilogram uh, body weight if you use 80 kVp. So actually, lowering the kVp offers a great potential for reduction of radiation and contrast dose. Here an example, left image baseline CT scan where we scanned with uh, 100 kV and the patient got 0.7 grams of iodine per kilogram body weight. You see good enhancement of the liver and the follow-up study we did with 80 kV and only 0.45 grams of iodine. So we saved one-third uh, of the iodine dose and you see you have roughly the same enhancement of the liver. Or another Example, upper row images, baseline scan uh, in September, 60 kilogram patient, we scanned with 100 kV, 120 milliliters at 300 concentration, so meaning that this is 0.6 grams of iodine per kilogram. And the follow-up study, only seven weeks later, we only used 80 kV and uh, uh, the contrast dose is only 0.4 grams of iodine, so we saved one third of the uh, contrast material dose, and by reducing uh, from 100 to 80 kV, you can save 30% in dose length product, so one third less dose in this patient just by lowering the, the kVp. Uh, what, are, what else are important issues or parameters for CT scanning? Of course, the slice thickness and the reconstruction interval. For viewing, we always use 3 millimeter thick slices with a 2 millimeter reconstruction interval. And then for the 3D reformations, we use uh, thinner slices. And we always do coronal reformations of the abdomen and chest and then sagittal reformations of the spine in bone window, and then also for some protocols for the esophageal cancer protocol, as I'll show you in a minute, we we'll also do sagittal reconstructions, and then sometimes in rectum protocol, not routinely because normally we use MRI for local staging, but if we cannot do it with MRI, then we will do it with CT, and also do sagittal reconstructions. And then for some indications, we also do kind of more advanced uh, reformations, curved planar reformations of volume render techniques, especially for the pancreas because uh, curved planar reconstructions are very nice for the delineation of abnormalities which cause stenosis of the pancreatic duct and also volume rendering for visualization of peripancreatic vessels. Here you see left-hand image, you see a perfectly normal CPR of the pancreas with a very thin and delicate pancreatic duct, and in the middle image you see a very uh, dilated pancreatic duct with atrophy of the pancreas, and you see an abrupt stenosis here, obviously caused by pancreatic cancer. And I always say these images are kind of surgeon proof because for demonstration purposes it's very easy for the uh, surgeons to understand these images, much easier than if you show a stack of uh, 50 axial images. And on the right-hand image, you see volume rendered technique, uh, which nicely shows the pure pancreatic vasculature in a normal pancreas. Uh, I would now like to present the protocols of, for various tumor entities for liver cancer, for the HCC protocol, we use a four-phasic protocol, meaning unenhanced scan, and then a triple-phasic protocol with a good flow rate, contrast 120, 4 milliliters per second. Then we use triphasic scan, arterial phase with a bolus transit time plus 15 seconds, so a more late arterial phase, which is better for visualization of HCC. Then a venous phase, roughly with an interscan delay of 30 seconds, and then a delayed phase with 
180 seconds of three minutes total delay time. And here you see unenhanced arterial phase with good enhancement of the artery and also some inflow into the portal vein. Then in the venous phase, you see good enhancement of the liver parenchyma. And then the delayed phase. The delayed phase actually is really not important for detection of lesions, but uh, it is very important for characterization of lesions, as I'll show in a minute. So what are the recommended guidelines of the European and of the American societies? If your patient with liver cirrhosis and you see a nodule sized one to two centimeters, they recommend, the European guidelines recommend to use a four phasic CT and an MRI. And if you see typical features of a hypervascular lesion with washout, then you can make the diagnosis of HCC. As you see here in this patient, hypervascular lesion in the arterial phase, it fades into isoattenuation in the venous phase, and in the delayed phase after three minutes, you see there is washout and the lesion is hypoattenuating. And you see the problem if you've done only biphasic scan, arterial and venous phase, you could not make the diagnosis because here in this patient you see the washout only in the delayed phase. And the European guidelines of the European Association of the Study of Liver Disease, it says one imaging technique is only recommended in centers of excellence with high-end radiologic equipment. So actually these hepatologists obviously uh, confuse, are confused and, and mix up that you don't need only high-end radiologic equipment. You need basically a high-end radiologist with experience to make the diagnosis. But in general, they say you should have two imaging techniques, whereas the American society says one imaging technique is sufficient to make the diagnosis. If you have this typical appearance in a patient with cirrhosis, it is sufficient to make the diagnosis of HCC. And if, it's, if you don't have any typical appearance, then you have to go on to biopsy. And then if you have nodules larger than two centimeters, both guidelines, European and American guidelines, agree that you either do four-phasic CT or MRI to look for this uh, typical appearance. And another example, here patient with liver cirrhosis in the arterial phase, you see this uh, hypervascular lesion, which is slightly hypodense in the venous phase. And again, you see nicely in the delayed phase that, that washout. So the very important features is wash in in the arterial phase and wash out, meaning it must be hypo-attenuating or hypo-intense in the venous and or in the delayed phase. Important issue is really, do we actually need the unenhanced scan or can we skip that for radiation purposes? And uh, two studies actually have dealt with this issue in the, in the last years, which said actually it was subjectively helpful only in a small minority of liver segments and, and adding an unenhanced CT scan really did not significantly increase the sensitivity. And another study compared such a four-phasic scan with unenhanced and triphasic after contrast with a triphasic scan without an unenhanced fa phase and said actually a four-phasic scan is not better than a triphasic scan. You may add an unenhanced scan for free if you're uh, using a dual energy CT scanner and you basically you can do a virtual non-contrast. But my recommendation actually is an unenhanced scan is really not routinely needed for detection and characterizing these lesions. What shall we do for pancreatic cancer? Uh, for pancreatic cancer, we have a different protocol than for liver cancer because we use uh, do a hydro CT. Patient has to drink 1.5 liters of water of, um, uh, immediately prior to the examination. We don't give buscopan or glucagon anymore. We stop doing that uh, with the modern scanners, which are very fast. We don't do an unenhanced CT scan now routinely anymore. And then we inject contrast. Uh, two milliliters per kilogram body weight, meaning this 0.6 grams of iodine, if you have to use 120 kVp 
high flow rate, 4 to 5 milliliters per second. And then for the pancreatic parenchymal phase where we scan the upper abdomen, we have a different delay time than for an arterial phase of the liver. We use an aortic transit time plus 25 seconds, which is roughly 10 seconds later than the typical arterial phase for liver imaging. And it has been shown in several studies that using an individual scan delay using the aortic transit time plus 25 seconds gives better enhancement than using a fixed delay of 40 seconds, which has been recommended in the early days of multi-detector CT. And then we, of course, do a venous phase scan of the abdomen and pelvis. Here you see the examples. You see a good enhancement of the pancreas in the parenchymal phase, also good enhancement of the peripancreatic vasculature. And in the venous phase, you still the contrast enhancement. You see some fading, but the vasculature is still good and nicely enhanced. And now you see good enhancement of the liver, which is important because you have to look also for liver metastases in pancreatic cancer patients. And then you also do volume render technique or MIP reconstructions. Here you see such a patient uh, with a large cancer invading the celiac trunk. Here you see the tumor sitting on the celiac trunk and encasing it and also the common hepatic artery, so clearly stage T4. And with the volume render technique, you see another large cancer. Here we did a paraaxial volume rendered image, and you see the cancer really uh, around the celiac trunk, leading to vessel irregularity of the celiac trunk, the hepatic artery, and the splenic artery. So basically, this is a T4 stage. And you also see this uh, tumor sitting here on the venous confluence, occluding the venous confluence on this volume rendered image which actually nicely shows in one image the entire problem for the surgeon. Uh, for patients with suspected neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas, we have a slightly different protocol because neuroendocrine tumors are very hypervascular. So if you suspect a neuroendocrine tumor, we do a real arterial phase imaging with an aortic transit time plus 15 seconds delay, so roughly the same delay as with an, um, a liver arterial phase. And then, of course, the venous phase. You see here a typical example of a, a neuroendocrine tumor sitting in the pancreatic head, very bright in the arterial phase, and it's almost isodense in the venous phase. Uh, how shall we scan our patients with esophageal cancer? Uh, like with pancreatic cancer, we do a hydro CT with 1.5 liters of water, and then we give share bait for esophageal distension. I'll show you in a minute. And then for the CT protocol, you can do either one of two ways, either scan in the arterial phase, the upper abdomen, and in the venous phase, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, or you can also do it that you scan in the arterial phase, the chest and abdomen, and add in the venous phase, abdomen and pelvis. Of course, it's important to look at the radial spread of the tumor and also on the longitudinal spread, lymph nodes and metastases uh, in the liver and in the lung. For lymph node imaging, as you know, we are not very sensitive and we are not very specific, specific because, size, because size criteria are a problem. Uh, how, should, how are we going to do this with the share bait? Well, with the share bait, you get good distension of the esophagus. So we give uh, share bait. You can either give the effervescent granules you use for double contrast uh, upper GI studies, or what we give is actually a share bait we buy in the candy store. You give one spoonful. Uh, without water actually immediately prior to starting the contrast monitoring sequence and the patient swallows it and uh, they get good distension by this. Here you see how it works. 
you see, uh, before we started the contest monitoring sequence, you don't see any distension of the esophagus. And just a few seconds late, you see nice distension of the esophagus with a very thin and delicate wall. So you see that there is no tumor here in the esophagus. To show an example how it works in a video, I hope this will load for you on your computer. You see that there is good distension of the esophagus uh, with air and there also some ingested material and you see this distal esophageal cancer obstructing the esophagus. And by giving sherbet you nicely delineate the esophagus and you can assess the longitudinal spread of tumor as you see here then on the reconstructions you see in the axial image you see the tumor actually invades into the adjacent fat tissue this is a T3 tumor and this is a tumor at the esophageal gastric junction they are called AEG adenocarcinomas of the esophageal gastric junction three different types type 1 would be cancer originating in the distal esophagus growing downward as you see here on the sagittal reconstruction or on this coronal reconstruction you see actually that the, the main center of this tumor is in the distal esophagus and it grows downward to the cardia or a different type a type 2 would be an adenocarcinoma uh, AEG type 2, which originates exactly at the cardia and grows downward and upwards. Here you see such an example of this tumor here in the cardia, which does not invade beyond the walls, meaning that this is a T2 uh, tumor. You have to look, of course, also for metastases, liver metastases, lung metastases, and also don't forget to look for supracavicular nodes in patients with gastric cancer. As you see here, there's a lymph node in the left supracavicular legion, so-called Virchow node. We then did an ultrasound, biopsied this lesion. Actually, this was the only distant metastasis in this patient here. So always look for supraclavicular nodes. With gastric cancer, we use the same hydro CT protocol, but without giving a share bait, and then look for local extension, lymph nodes, and distant metastases in the liver and in the peritoneum. Here you see a large cancer in the antrum and body. You see the axial images, coronal reformations with invasion into the adjacent fat plane. Um, after surgery, this was found to be a T3 tumor, but N0. Uh, zero of the 25 lymph nodes uh, were positive. The problem with the lymph nodes is that we have a very poor negative predictive value to exclude lymph node involvement, as you see only 43%, but we have actually a quite good negative predictive value to exclude local invasion, so we can uh, quite reliably exclude T3 stage with CT. Here another example of a tumor which is slightly different, a gastric gist, which uh, originates in the wall of the uh, stomach, and you see nicely the, uh, the, the mucosa overlying this tumor being intact. Usually these gist tumors are slightly hypervascular. You here you see this is a T2 tumor, and you see with endosonography, you see here this uh, submucosal mass, and you see this uh, big ball sitting here in the gastric wall, but with an intact mucosa here. Are there mistakes uh, you could make? Certainly, if you don't give water. You see here in this patient with a very large gastric cancer, the baseline scan shows nicely this large tumor here invading the adjacent fat plane and also here the tumor. So clearly this is at least a T3 tumor spreading into the adjacent fat. And then follow-up scan after chemotherapy, half a year later, no water was given because the patient couldn't tolerate uh, uh, to get water. And then basically you don't see the tumor uh, but the tumor is not gone because three months later, when we gave water here in April 2017, you see after chemotherapy, the tumor is smaller after chemo, but 
certainly there is residual tumor sitting there. So without giving water, you have no chance of detecting smaller tumors. So hydro CT is key. For another example, where we actually ask the ward to give the water up there before bringing down the patients because we were in a hurry, said, yeah, 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 we've given two liters of water in the, to the patient, and then the patient was brought down, we did the CT scan, and if you look at the CT, absolutely, there's absolutely no water on board in this patient, and you really cannot tell where is the tumor. The only thing you can say is that obviously uh, there are no signs of tumor spread beyond the wall. And if you look at the endoscopic images in this patient, actually this is not a very small cancer, but still we can't, can't see it. So basically the important point is uh, uh, we don't know what the patient did with the water. Probably he watered the flowers on the ward, but uh, really oral contrast has to be administered in the radiology department and under our control, otherwise it doesn't work. What other mistakes you would like to avoid? One mistake could uh, be just doing a single phasic scan because liver metastases are a very important issue in patients with gastric cancer because patients with liver metastases have unresectable disease, and if you only do a venous phase scan, you may have trouble differentiating between this and uh, metastases. As you see here, very small lesion, which is very sharply demarcated in the venous phase scan, some fuzzy edges here, which this turned out to be a metastasis, but if you look at the arterial phase scan, you can, in the arterial phase scan, still see this very sharply demarcated small cyst, whereas uh, the metastasis is actually not well seen. So arterial phase scan, the biphasic scanning really helps in differentiating. For lymph node staging, we have problems with gastric cancer because that 10 millimeter side threshold actually is quite inaccurate and the location dependent side threshold is superior, but it's uh, certainly more complicated. Last uh, tumor entity I would like to discuss is colorectal cancer, and you have to be aware that colon cancer and rectal cancer are biologically really different tumor entities. What protocol should be used? The recommendation of the European Society of Medical Oncology says do a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, although they say alternatively you could still do a chest x-ray, but we always do a CT of chest and abdomen, arterial phase of the abdomen, upper abdomen and venous phase scanning of chest, abdomen and pelvis. And again, we use oral contrast, usually water, or you may also give a positive oral contrast. What do we have to look for in colon cancer? Patients with the T1 or T3 cancer basically all undergo surgery or in a few instances with very small T1 cancers only mucosectomy. So basically it's not so important to say whether this is a T2 or a T3 tumor by CT. The important point is to say is this a T4 stage a tumor invading into an adjacent organ because this will affect surgery. Does the patient has have tumor obs or colon obstruction because such a patient will need immediate surgery or does the patient have perforation and of course we have to look for M stage. Here you see a patient with colon cancer you see certainly several limb, uh, liver metastases here in both lobes of the liver. You see the tumor here invading into the adjacent fat and just to show you the inaccuracy of uh, lymph node staging, what we see here are several clustered, large, rounded lymph nodes. Are these positive? Well, at after surgery and uh, histologic assessment, it was found it was N0, and none of the 20 lymph nodes in the resection specimen were found to be positive. So we are quite inaccurate for uh, lymph node staging. How about rectal cancer? What shall we look for? The local staging is done with MRI, with the diffusion and gadolinium. 
only if there are counterindications to MRI, then endosonography comes into play or CT in stenotic tumors. And if there's perforation, such as in this case with a large abscess around the tumor. With CT, of course, you shall exclude distant metastases, as in this patient with liver metastasis. So we do, again, CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And the European guidelines at least say that the routine use of PET-CT is not recommended only in very select circumstances. So let me come to the conclusion. In patients with uh, cancer, the rate of contrast-induced nephropathy may be higher, so we have to be aware of that, and we should adapt our protocols and try to uh, use less contrast material in these patients. Nowadays, we can use dose-reduced protocol with iterative reconstruction and tube current and tube voltage modification, and we shall optimize our CT protocol and tailor that according to the tumor entity. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Shima, uh, for an excellent presentation. Uh, we have been getting questions uh, during your presentation, so I'll go through them one by one. Uh, so the, our first question is about the ports. Uh, they say, how, what is the limit, limited number of power injections which can be made to these ports? For example, 20 before they need to be replaced? No, basically there is no upper number or limited number of injections. So if, if uh, you use this, uh, this port according uh, to what the instruction leaflet says, Basically, there is no limitation. The natural limitation of the life of the port system usually is the thrombosis or, okay. or maybe an infection. But it's not that, that the repeated CT injections are the problem. So the injection will not cause problem, but if they have to no. uh, replace port because of thrombosis no. or let's say there is an infec infection no. on the side, they will have to change it for that. Yeah. So, thank yeah. you very much. The, the, the inject, if, if, if you, you would use a too high injection, basically the mm -hmm. power injector will, will regulate that and you could not basically rupture the, the, the uh, port system. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you. So, our next question is about uh, hepatocellular carcinoma protocol. And... Uh, the question is about, do we really need a portal or hepatic phase for these uh, cancers? Uh, definitely. You need, you need triphasic after contrast because certainly in some patients you see the washout only in the delayed phase, but in some patients you better see it in the venous phase. And one very important issue, I didn't mention that for the sake of time, is, mm -hmm. is there tumor thrombosis of the portal vein? And mm -hmm. you really would see this spread into the portal vein, which has a tremendous impact on the therapy of the patients only or, or at least best in the portal venous phase. Okay. So you would strongly recommend that we have the, the triphasic yeah. uh, approach for yeah. hepatocellular yeah. cancer. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you for that. Now, next question is from Nathan. He wants to know about the preheating. And he said, majority of the CT scan use 7 liter. I don't know why it's 7 liter. Maybe it's a misprint there. 5 mil per second of volume rate. And uh, preheating may not be needed in these cases according to ACR. What do you recommend for preheating of the contrast? Pre preheating is an issue if you have a port system, or it's especially an issue if you have a port system, because with port systems you really want to have a low viscosity. If you have a nice venous axis, large IV cannula uh, you know, at the side of the elbow, basically mm -hmm. you can do a four or five milliliter injection uh, whether this contrast has room temperature or is preheated to body temperature, that doesn't make a difference. It's, it's only the port systems where basically lowering the viscosity will, will allow you to, to have a higher flow rate. Okay. So um, preheating is 
not a, a prerequisite for every time. Uh, it, no, uh, that no. I understand. No. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Uh, next question is about oral hydration. The question is not very clear, but uh, it says what time we give oral hydration, possibly one hour before. Uh, I don't know if it's in context of uh, AKI or any, any other thing, but uh, yeah. the question is about oral hydration. The question of prehydration uh, is is quite Im quite important, but it's quite difficult. And I don't know how many studies have dealt with this issue uh, using IV hydration or oral hydration. Mm -hmm. And then some recent study actually said you can even overhydrate patients. And if you overhydrate mm -hmm. patients, then you can even have do some harm to the patients. So what what we do actually is. We, uh, if we see that the patient has a significant problem with the kidney, you're basically uh, having a low uh, GFR below 45, we usually uh, give IV hydration because that has okay. an immediate impact. If we give oral hydration, we would start, uh, I think just also because of the workflow, we would start one hour prior to, to scanning. But it probably would be nice to do to, to two or three hours before starting the scanning and, and to do it over a prolonged period of time, although never really has proven that this is superior to one hour before scanning. But I think just for the workflow, I think it's clearly sufficient to start one hour before. So it's more practical and pragmatic approach, yeah, if yeah. I understand yeah, correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now, a related question uh, from Ronaldo is that: uh, What is your comment on the protocol where we advocate NPO nil by uh, nil per orally uh, and giving IV contrast to avoid aspiration? If there is any contrast reaction and increased incidence of contrast reactions in these uh, patients? Yeah. 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 Uh, this. This was. I would say. In, in the early days of contrast with ionic contrast, which uh, produced much more adverse reactions that we would say nothing per oral. I mean, I'm aware of at least one study where they looked at a kind of a randomized controlled trial, nothing per oral or oral contrast, and really did not find in one patient aspiration. And I really have to say, I haven't seen in a single patient in the last, I would say, 10 years doing tens of thousands of, of CT examinations, one patient aspirating on, on the table. But I think by not giving oral contrast, we would have missed so many pathologies being relevant for the patient. So I would really strongly advocate giving oral contrast. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, the next question is about CT protocol. It's uh, about larynx and neck CT. What uh, protocol would you recommend for these? Uh, I know we have focused here on abdominal cancer, but uh, if you can give a few top hints on larynx and neck uh, CT. Certainly, and, and particularly because sometimes we, you include the neck in patients with uh, with uh, chest, abdomen, and pelvis CT, in for example, in patients with lymphoma, where we want to do uh, neck, chest, and abdomen, and there's also this discussion: should we do this arms up, one acquisition starting neck, chest, and abdomen, or shall we do uh, just arms up, chest, and abdomen, and then uh, arms down, and do then the neck in the second acquisition? We do it uh, with the arms up if we do neck, chest, and abdomen, and again do it with a 3D uh, with, with a three millimeter slice thickness. And for the neck, we do extra reconstructions because we do uh, magnified reconstructions. If you do the neck alone, uh, you can give much less contrast than for the abdomen, where if we do the neck alone without chest and abdomen, we give roughly 70 milliliters per contrast, well, 300 uh, milligrams of, of iodine with a lower flow rate, basically 2.5 or 3 milliliters per second is sufficient, and do it in the venous phase scan. 
Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very, very comprehensive answer. Thank you, Professor. Ma. Now, next question is about the negative contrast with water. They say, uh, how would you administer water one to two liter as a negative contrast? Yeah, but sim simply the patient has to drink it. Um, and by giving a negative contrast, meaning that the patient has to drink the water before scanning, means that you have a good contrast uh, or attenuation difference between the enhancing gastric wall or the enhancing duodenum uh, and pancreas and the low density uh, duodenal lumen. So the patients simply come to us, uh, sit there and in 20 minutes before we start the acquisition they they have to drink the water one liter and last half liter of water they drink immediately before the step on the table. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for explaining it very clearly. Uh, now, next question is about renally impaired patients, uh, and they say, is it still true that a renally impaired patient can receive IV contrast if they go for dialysis afterward? No, uh, there are there are some some nice review articles have been recently published, which strongly recommend not doing dialysis because dialysis by itself carries a significant morbidity and the protective effect has not been proven. Um, but the good news is actually we know now that obviously the the risk of contrast is much lower and, and the European guidelines by ESO actually reflect that, saying that the patient at risk is actually the patient with a GFR below 45 milliliters per minute. And even in our clinical practice, we do CT scans. If it's important indication and the patient has a GFR between 30 and 45, we still do a CT. Of course, in these patients, we try to lower the contrast dose by lowering the KVP, and then we can, as I said, we can give, give less contrast. But actually, nephrology strongly advises not doing dialysis because that, that will do or may do harm to the patient. Yeah, thank you very much, and I agree with you because ESC guidelines, at least in cardiology setup, uh, they, the recommendation is uh, three, which means it should not be done. So uh, yeah. thank you for uh, the answer. And the next question, I'm not very sure what uh, is the question, and they say, what about contrast media at 350 milligram per ml of iodine? So... Well, uh, I mean, this is this this is this is contrast material with a higher concentration. As I would say, the standard contrast materials with 300 to 320, and then you have the higher concentration 350, 370, or 400, which you may use for for CT angiography. But basically, I, I, the important issue is really not so much the the concentration, but the iodine delivery rate. So basically, how much iodine goes into the patient per second? And roughly, you get the same enhancement using a 300 milligram uh, content at 4 milliliters per second uh, as if you would use a 400 milligram iodine content with a flow rate mm -hmm. of 3 milliliters per second. So it's the iodine delivery rate. So you may use higher concentrations, and by doing this, you can lower the injection rate to get the same iodine delivery rate. So if I understand correctly, uh, if the iodine rate and the concentration you multiply, that is the number which is yeah. more important? Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. if I may add, is this there a trend? I think you mentioned very clearly in your uh, answer and in the discussion also, we should have a trend towards lower iodine and lower KV, uh, so that low radiation. So, yeah. is that correct? That 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 is correct. So, by by lowering, I would say by lowering the 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 iodine we give, basically, I think the 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 demand to have a high concentration becomes less and less important because actually we we give in total now. Lower lower amounts of iodine than we've given five or ten years ago. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Now, the next question is, is it worth doing a delay if an incidental lien is seen on routine portal venous phase with no arterial phase? Uh, well, um, this is a difficult or it, 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 that, That's a good question. Uh, if you see, I would say probably we are, we are uh, dealing with uh, an incidental focal liver lesion. Mm -hmm. It may well be worth doing it if you do it immediately. If you, let's say if you see kind of a small lesion, a uh, hypodense lesion in the liver and you're not really sure is this really a cyst or does this fill in, uh, mm -hmm. then if you do an immediate three-minute scan, this could actually replace an arterial phase. I don't think it, it will be worth doing it if you uh, yeah, find this after 10 minutes and then bring the patient back. But if you do an immediate three-minute scan, this could actually mm -hmm. help and solve some of the problems uh, you may have with a venous phase scan only. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. And next question is about metastasis. Uh, which phase are we able to notice this metaphys uh, metastasis? So, um, when they will be more, more that, prominent, I think. Yeah. Uh, in general, uh, the venous phase is the, is the most important because most of the metastases tend to be hypovascular, and especially adenocarcinoma metastases tend to be hypovascular. Only 5% roughly are hypervascular. So if you deal with esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer, for most of these tumor entities, you will see the metastases in the liver best in the venous phase. If you're dealing with renal cell cancer or neuroendocrine cancer, they have to, or they tend to see hypervascular metastases. These metastases may be better seen in the arterial phase, but most of the entities we discussed today, the venous phase mm -hmm. scan is the best phase. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, next is a very straightforward uh, question. It says, what is Sherbet? Sherbet. Sherbet. Basically, yeah. these, these uh, how can you explain that? Basically, sherbet is, is this powder you give for double contrast or, or the powder we've all eaten in our childhood, which has this, gives you this sizzling feeling in the mouth, and, or you can just pour it into water and it bubbles. But this is this crystalline powder. Uh, basically, if you put it in the mouth, you have this, this feeling of bubbling in your mouth, and this produces gas. CO2 in your, CO, in, in your esophagus if you swallow that. I think there is a chocolate now which also gives you that crackling feeling in your mouth, so I'm sure... Okay, I see. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, yeah. we don't have this in Austria, but I could oh, try okay. this otherwise we'll with our patients. You from UK, yes, yes. I think. Yeah. So, the next question, we have a lot of questions coming in, uh, in uh, Professor Shima, so I'll go to the next one, is can you use higher injection flow rate if you have a dual uh, flow injector? No, for the, for the, the dual flow uh, or, or the, the dual flow injector, basically with that, you only have contrast and water. So basically saline to flush the contrast into the venous system. Otherwise, a lot of the contrast will be trapped in the peripheral veins. Uh, with a dual, flow rate of dual injector, basically, you, you, even if you put up two uh, bottles of contrast, you cannot inject higher because the pr it's the pressure limiter that, that will limit the injection speed. It's only for a dual injector that the water will give you better enhancement because you, you flush uh, the contrast into the venous system. Okay, thank you. And the next question is about cystic uh, metastasis, I think. Uh, for cystic mats, which CT protocol would you advise uh, nat native and portal phase or arterial and portal phase um, CT? I, 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 I don't think that for cystic metastasis, if you think about uh, uh, ovarian cancer, which may, mm. may produce cystic metastases, and, and quite often you see also not only liver metastases, but also peritoneal spread. Uh, 
But if you look at uh, cystic liver metastases, mm -hmm. um, I don't think you need an unenhanced scan. What you really need is an arterial phase because you may see this uh, very thin and delicate rim of peripheral enhancement in the arterial phase. But if you see this, basically, I don't think that you would need to, to have an unenhanced scan, basically, to compare this. So, again, it's a, it's a dual phasic scan after contrast arterial and venous phase. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, I think we already discussed, but uh, it's uh, about the low KV and low flow rate uh, for obese patient. Does this protocol still apply that uh, can we dose reduced protocol? Uh, well, for, for obese patients, uh, certainly you cannot reduce or at least the system or probably the system will not even allow to reduce uh, the KV to 100 or or 80 uh, KVP. So for obese patients quite often we not only have to use 120 but even 140 KVP with a quite quite a high dose. But the important message is even in the obese patient, and it's even more important in the obese patient to use iterative reconstruction because if you use mm -hmm. iterative reconstruction, you can still go down with the MAS, but most likely you could not reduce the KVP in these patients. Okay, yeah, very clear answer. Thank you. Now, about uh, colorectal cancer, is it necessary to clean the intestine before they drink water? I think it's no. bowel preparation. No. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 because basically. I think drinking the water is actually also a kind of natural hydration for, for everybody, which uh, is, is certainly good. And also to give you a kind of nice delineation of the small bowel, because sometimes uh, they are very closely packed together and you're not, not sure whether these are lymph nodes or is it just a collapsed small bowel. But you know, mm -hmm. if, if the colon, colon is filled with feces, this is perfectly fine since actually for colon cancer, it is not really the task of, of radiology to say whether this is a T1 or T2 or T3 tumor. Of course, quite often you see this is a T3 tumor and then we report it. But since patients with T2 and T3 will all undergo surgery, it's not that really important to clean the colon. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, I think there's a lot of questions about hydration. Uh, if uh, uh, the patient uh, who ca has limitation on water intake, does IV hydration a uh, viable substitute for that? It's not clear yeah. whether they sure. cannot physically drink or is it uh, because... Sure. Yeah. yeah, but you know, some some patients cannot drink because they have nausea, and this is not uncommon in cancer patients. Certainly, IV hydration is in general the method of hydration which is better than oral hydration. But of course, it's it's more more work for everybody. But clearly, you can do intravenous hydration either with saline or studies have have shown that bicarbonate is maybe uh, even superior to saline. But IV hydration, of course, is fine. Okay, good. Uh, now, the next question is about renally impaired patients. Uh, and the question is, how much oral contrast is absorbed uh, to affect these uh, patients? Will it affect those patients who have renal impairment? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any study which has actually looked at that in detail in the past. But of course, as you say, quite often, or sometimes, we see that there is a little bit of resorption of oral contrast, or you may even see that there is resorption in the peritoneum uh, of contrast, which will then appear in the, in the collecting system. But that's the reason why most of the time, actually, or basically, we have switched for oral contrast, we have switched actually from dilute iodine contrast, where we use the dilution of one part iodine contrast and 50 parts water, to which gives you a positive oral contrast. We've actually switched to water. So basically, in, in this particular instance, you don't have to worry at all, even in patients with... Um, 
with uh, um, allergies or anaphylactic reactions to contrast material, water is perfect. But if you if you use uh, really dilute uh, or positive oral contrast, the, the the amount you give is so small. Actually, having said one one to fifty, so really that should not be a problem or cannot be a problem with renal leaf impaired patients. Yeah, and the next question is also about there are a lot of questions about hydration and uh, dialysis and how to go about them. Uh, it's also asking about uh, dialysis, how necessary it is, how to coordinate dialysis with end stage renal patients. There was another question: Will will there be more adverse events with with uh, renally impaired patients? And if we give IV hydration, will it cause hypertension? So, I think if you well, can give a general uh, comment, you have already. I, I, I mean, the the, the the IV hydration. I think it's it's not really the the important thing that it it may cause hypertension, but certainly if you have a kind of a, a vulnerable patient who has uh, cardiac problem and you mm -hmm. then very vigorously hydrate this patient, the patient may develop lung edema and cardiac insufficiency. So in these patients actually coming from cardiology, we always consult with the cardiologist how much actually can we give uh, without uh, putting the patient at risk. So I think this, this is the important, more important issue than, than causing hypertension, which can easily control normally with, with, with medication. And again, dialysis, if you, if you do basically uh, contrast material administration, we, we don't do a kind of, af and you say the patient is on, has been on dialysis before CT and would need a dialysis afterwards, then certainly mm -hmm. we try to place the CT uh, examination close to the next dialysis. But we don't do any urgent dialysis after that. It's mm -hmm. usually not necessary, so, no. So what I'm hearing is that if, to answer all these questions, yes, dialysis, if you if have to be done, you bring it near, and yeah. patient has to be managed case by case, but yeah. they are all very manageable. But, Complications, yeah, if, if you yeah, can. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. yeah, but the, yeah, if, if the patient has been on dialysis before, but absolutely mm -hmm. no indication for prophylactic dialysis after Absolutely contract. clear. Yeah, thank you. That's very clear, and thank you. Now, slightly on a different subject, uh, uh, it's about uh, adrenal gland imaging, and um, the question is what time delay do you use in protocol for adrenal gland imaging? Let's say 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Is there an advantage for using a longer? Uh, 15 minutes delay? Well, I, I, I really, really have to say uh, that uh, I, I know several studies have been published with a 10-minute delay or 50-minute delay or 20-minute delay to, to calculate that, that percentage washout. We quite rarely uh, do it at uh, a, delayed, a long delayed scan for adrenal imaging because usually if we see that the patient has uh, an adrenal lesion, the patient is long gone, uh, so we cannot do just a 10-minute uh, delay uh, scan. But if, if we see this, then we usually do a 10-minute uh, delayed uh, scan and to, to calculate the percentage washout. But most of, most of the time, we, we wouldn't do it. Okay, good. Thank you. And uh, next question is about aortic transit time. Do you mean a bolus tracking in the aorta? Yeah, yeah. We, we always do uh, a bolus tracking. Uh, we don't use a test bolus anymore. Uh, only in very few instances, I would say, if we do a venous phase scan and we say, well, let's do it just with a fixed delay of 65 or 70 seconds. But for all these injections or, or, or scans where you do an arterial phase scan, you basically have to get uh, bolus tracking in the aorta because the cardiac function is so different in patients, so you may be totally off the optimal time window if you don't do this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. The, we have a lot more questions, so I'll just go for one more question. And this is about the neck pathology. Uh, they, uh, they are saying that you, they use one ml per second, 100 mils, scanning at 100 seconds. 
do you use this protocol is this something which you can recommend or comment on please a, 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 proto, a, a protocol for, for which tumor entity or which indication it's neck pathology any uh, neck uh, oh okay for 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 neck imaging uh, actually yeah. this this no uh, this would be a, a kind of a slow, too slow flow and a too long a delay so basically we would not we would give a higher flow rate as i said 2.5 to 3 ml per second and then would would do it in more venous phase because 100 100 seconds really you you don't have good enhancement of the carotid artery anymore and also of the of the internal jugular vein anymore so i think yeah we we go for high flow rate on shorter shorter delay Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shima. Um, we have a lot more questions, but they are on the similar pattern, so I've tried to cover all, all okay. the topics which people are asking questions, and it's very good to see a very interactive session. So thank you very much for your time today. It has been a pleasure uh, listening to you and uh, uh, answering all those questions. So once again, thank you very much, and all of you have a very good day. Take care. Bye from and, Amasha. And, and, and thank you, and good Goodbye also here from a very sunny Vienna. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye.